Okay, my name's Russell Sweet, and I'll be your host as we explore this relatively new science and discover the history in defining modern psychology. Psychology has made an amazing progression in the past two centuries. When you consider we started with Plato and Aristotle debating whether ideas originated in the brain or the heart. So come on, let's discuss psychology. Before a certain point, people relied on intuition and mob mentality to explain issues of the mind. Got bad morals? You probably have a bumpy skull. Does your head hurt? It's probably full of demons. Ugh, this headache won't go away. But then science stepped up to the plate. On a nice December day in 1879, the first psychology laboratory was erected in Leipzig, Germany. Its founder, a philosopher and physiologist by the name of Wilhelm Wundt. See, it's German, so the W sounds like a V. <clears throat> Together with two others, Wundt was attempting what many consider psychology's first experiment. The experimental apparatus that Wundt and colleagues designed was meant to measure the time lag between an individual's hearing a ball hit a platform and their pressing a telegraph key. Wundt was attempting to measure atoms of the mind, which was considered the fastest and simplest mental process. After completing the experiment, Wundt discovered that individuals responded in about one-tenth of a second when asked to press the key after hearing the sound. Curiously though, they responded in two-tenths of a second as soon as they were consciously aware of perceiving the sound. What Wundt found was that the conscious awareness of hearing the sound takes a little longer than one's reflex. In 1892, one of Wundt's students, Edward Bradford Titchener, joined the Cornell University faculty. There, he introduced the concept of structuralism. The goal was to discern the structure of the mind through a self-reflective method called introspection. The purpose of this method was to present people with a stimulus, such as listening to a metronome, smelling a scent, or looking at a brightly colored object, and then collecting their immediate reactions. Titchener wanted the participants to self-report in as much detail their sensations, images, and feelings, so to better understand how it all related to one another. Unfortunately, the data proved unreliable. In order to get a clear response, introspection required intelligent verbal individuals. Another hang-up was that a person's reactions often varied based on their life experiences. 61 years earlier, a man boarded a vessel named the HMS Beagle on an expedition from England. Charles Darwin, later to be named the father of evolution, was a naturalist and geologist studying wildlife on board. During his travel, Darwin studied many animals closely and coined the term adaptive traits. These specific traits were passed down through the gene pool and contributed to an organism's survival. Fast forward to the late 1800s, and an American psychologist by the name of William James introduces the concept of functionalism, inspired by Darwin's theories on adaptive traits. James believed that the concept of thinking developed to aid our ancestors in survival. Since structuralism began to wane due to its lack of scientific technique, functionalism took a foothold in the psychological community. Its purpose was to concentrate less on structure of the mind and more on what the mind does and how behavior functions. By exploring emotions, memories, habits, and stream of consciousness, James hoped to find what roles behavior played in allowing people to satisfy their needs. William James did more than just introduce functionalism, he also lectured students on psychology at Harvard. He loved his students and taught in a fun, informative manner. He was reportedly the first American professor to solicit end-of-course evaluations. James displayed the same enthusiasm when he admitted Mary Culkins into his graduate seminar, in defiance with the other faculty and even Harvard's president. 
In a courageous attempt to ensure gender equality, James and several of Colkin's close associates became engrossed in a heated debate with the dean. When it was evident that he would not win, the dean reluctantly allowed Colkins to sit in on lectures, but only under the stipulation that she would not be a registered student. When Colkins joined, many of the other students believed it to be a joke. When it was apparent that it was the truth, all the other students dropped out, leaving her as his only pupil. James then took it upon himself to tutor her alone throughout the years on the psychological disciplines and theories. Mmm, psychology. Go. Push it, girl. Push it through. Oh, baby, you got it right there. all her PhD requirements and even outscored all the male students on the qualifying exam. In the end, Harvard denied her the PhD and attempted to pawn off another one from their undergraduate sister school. She refused the unequal treatment and instead went on to become a distinguished memory researcher. And in 1905, she became the American Psychological Association's first female president. But not to fear, feminists. When Harvard robbed Calkins the chance to be psychology's first female psychology PhD, the honor fell to Margaret Floyd Washburn. In 1894, she later went on to become the second female APA president. So why mention these women in my review? Aside from their impressive works, Mary Culkins went on to become a respected researcher of memory and was even quoted by Freud in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams. And Margaret Washburn wrote an influential book on animals and completed the first foreign study to be published by Wundt in his journal. These women are just the tip of the spear that is female presence in the field of psychology. From 1996 to 2009, women claimed two-thirds or more of the new psychology PhDs, not only in North America, but in Europe as well. They also make up 9 out of 21 elected presidents in the Association of Psychological Science. Since the late 1800s, women have transformed the way psychology is viewed and defined. Way to go, ladies. Aside from his introduction of functionalism and his support of equal gender rights, William James completed the first psychological textbook. The famous publisher, Henry Holt, offered James the contract after being impressed by his dozens of well-received articles. James agreed to write it in 1878 and began to work. After some time and an apology, he requested another two years to finish it. The textbook proved to be incredibly difficult, though, and was finally completed after 12 years. But after a century later, people still read his text, Principles of Psychology, and are impressed by the brilliance he had in introducing psychology to the educated public. In the early 1900s, a Venetian physician proposed that behavior was motivated by inner forces and conflicts about which we have little awareness or control. This unconscious psychic activity indicated what a person was truly feeling as evidenced by their dreams or slips of the tongue. Because of his work, Sigmund Freud is intimately linked with the psychodynamic perspective. This view states that behavior is motivated by unconscious inner forces. Many of these forces are proposed to be ingrained in us at an early age. While many think of Freud when discussing psychoanalysis, he was associated with many other theories, concepts, and actions. Some of them we won't talk about just yet. Wundt and Titchener were focused on inner sensations and feelings, James on introspection, and Freud on the unconscious. So until the 1920s, psychology was defined as the science of mental life. But from the 20s into the 60s, American psychologists John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner stated that psychology should be science rooted in observation. Since you cannot observe sensations or feelings, you must observe and record people's behaviors as they respond to the situations. This was the dawn of the behaviorists. They dismissed introspection and redefined psychology as the scientific study of observable behavior. A separate psychological perspective pioneered by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow was named humanistic psychology. Humanism rebelled against Freudian psychology and behaviorism. It felt that behaviorism's focus on learning was too mechanistic, and rather than focusing on the meaning of early childhood memories, humanism emphasized the importance of current environmental influences on our growth, and encouraged someone to strive for their full potential. In the 1960s, another movement emerged in the form of a cognitive revolution. 
This perspective supported ideas developed by earlier scientists, such as the framework of the brain and the importance of our mind processing information. This has spawned cognitive psychology and more recently, cognitive neuroscience. Both have expanded upon previous ideas to explore scientifically the way we perceive, process, and remember information. A battle raged between psychologists on what the definition would be. Every perspective had their own opinions on the importance of mental process and behavior. Behaviorists disagreed with psychoanalysis. Humanists objected to both. Cognitive borrowed its concepts from many of these perspectives, but fought hard for its individual ideals. Therefore, it was decided that a common collaborative definition must be created, one term to rule them all. These perspectives illustrate psychology's origins in respect to the many disciplines within the field. While there are many perspectives out there, these are some of the ones that have helped shape our definition of psychology. Today we define psychology as the science of behavior and mental process. Behavior is anything an organism does, such as an action we can observe and record. Mental process is the internal subjective experience we infer from behavior. But the key word in the definition is science. For psychology, like any science, is less a list of findings than a way of asking and answering questions. Everyday theories are disproven and replaced with new and proved ideas. Psychology is seen to evolve with the times. Some of the most modern perspectives include behavior genetics, evolutionary, and sociocultural. The field of psychology is ever-expanding and is as complex as every one of us. I look forward to discovering that field together with you as we delve deeper into what makes up psychology. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope to do more videos in the future on a wide variety of psychological topics. If you like this movie, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to click like for psych. Thank you.